So welcome everyone to this very special webinar on a, on a special day also uh, in Mauritius where we celebrate actually St. Mary's Day. So that's, that's interesting because we had originally planned this webinar on the day of Mary Magdalene. <laughs> and without doing this consciously looking at the calendar, um, we're still on a sacred feminine day, which is really also the, the theme of, of today. So my name is uh, Andrew Smitsman, um, and I am the co-founder of Earth Eye Center. I'm here with my partner, Dr. Kurt Barnes, uh, who's chair and also co-founder of Earth Eye Center, and our dear friend, attorney, <laughs> uh, Laura George, uh, was also the founder of the um, Oracle Institute, as well as the Peace Pentagon, an incredible women's activist also, um, and a mystic and an author. <laughs> you you carry many different hats, uh, Laura. So, uh, and uh, especially she's for us a very, very dear friend. So we are, you know, delighted to be hosting the three of us, this webinar for all of you. We welcome you from wherever you are in the world. And um, the theme of today's webinar is that we will be exploring the transition into as well as the qualities and features of what we'll call the fifth paradigm. And Laura especially will take us onto that journey because that's been the center of her work and to really prepare humanity for that really important shift. <laughs> uh, and um, we'll also be sharing with you a little bit about what the five future archetypes that feature in Earth Eyes have to do with all of that, uh, as well as giving a little peek into the intensive that we'll be hosting um, with Laura at her beautiful Peace Pentagon, which is a very sacred location you can see behind her in fact we see the world in the oldest river in the united states so that is amazing blessed also by the hopis and the um the kogi right the kogi came to to bless the land as well yeah so in an amazing uh, amazing place and kurt will also be sharing a little bit from as his expertise as a, as a social psychological expert about the psychological shifts that are necessary as part of this uh, fifth paradigm um, which we also in earthlines refer to as becoming the future humans of the emerging new era so before i give a little bit of context we always like to start our webinars and uh, also always our classes with a little bit of a centering um, because that means that the quality of our attention, the quality of our listening and the quality of our contribution uh, is then always much more refined and much more present. So I'd just like to ask you to just take a moment uh, as you are here with us in this circle mm. to take a few deep centering breaths, breathing in, I'm holding for a few seconds and then breathing out, letting go of any tensions that you may feel. And taking a few more of these deep, nurturing, relaxing breaths in. I'm holding for a few seconds and then breathing out. And with every new breath that you take as you're breathing life in you're breathing into your wisdom and as you're breathing out you're just letting go and allowing that beautiful wisdom to guide and support you and allowing yourself to be fully present here and now so that we can with that now begin our webinar together so i'd like to give a little bit of context and then i will hand it over to laura and then um, after that kurt i will bring you back here with us so so the context also for these uh free webinars that we've been hosting from earth Ice is also um in support of 99 days of peace through unity um, which is uh, a beautiful collaborative initiative from Unity Earth and, and many other global partners for the theme this year is New Earth Rising. And the New Earth Rising, of course, speaks to that greater promise also of a new beginning. Uh, the New Earth Rises also speaks to 
our own transformative capacities, and we could perhaps even say a rebirth <laughs> for humanity. And that as we are going through these very challenging times and we are confronted, uh, and maybe in ways that we never have been, as a species level about the impact of our actions and the absolute necessity to change uh, at a very deep level, very fundamental level, how we relate with life, how we relate with each other, how we take care of our planets, and how we also act as good future ancestors for the future generations. And that's why all of this work uh, is really in service of that. It's, it's really about asking ourselves that question, what does it mean to be a future ancestor of an emerging new civilization? And what we've made a commitment to as Earthwise, uh, and hence also our Earthwise constitution, which you may have heard about in other webinars that we've given, and Laura is also a steward uh, of our Earthwise constitution, is the commitment for humanity to come into a planetary civilization. We've had a lot of different civilizations already, uh, and it's important to also learn the lessons from those civilizations that collapsed, that didn't work, so that we don't repeat the same lessons. And um, when we are speaking here about a planetary civilization, what we're really meaning in, uh, in that shift is the understanding that there is already a larger civilization um, of life on Earth. And this is the civilization of Earth <laughs> as a sentient and conscious being, not just a planet of resources. And that humans are just one of the many members in that web of life. And what does it mean to become in right relationship with all of those other members within the web of life? So that's really a planetary civilization is founded on a very deep sense of partnership. Partnership of the masculine and the feminine, and Laura's going to share a lot more about that, but also partnership with both our ancestors that came before us and uh, also the future generations. Partnership also with the earth herself, partnership with life, partnership with the cosmos, with, with consciousness itself, and in partnership with these future human potentials that live within all of us uh, as these latent capacities to really rise up and come together and to develop our evolutionary capacities at a collective level um, in, in ways that we have never had also the opportunity to do as we do now, because we also have at this time incredible technology that makes it possible for us to be in that conversation, to live that commitment together, just like all of us are here together now. So we want to honor and acknowledge for all of you who are here today, as well as everyone who will be listening to this later. I want to thank you and honor you uh, for all the commitments that you are making in your life and to our world and to humanity in the future generations uh, that are making that great shift, this great transformation possible. So with this, Laura, would you could you share with us a little bit about <laughs> the shift into the fifth paradigm, the role of women as well, uh, so that you can really as inspire us uh, yeah, to take that commitment and to, to live from that place? It would be my pleasure to do that, and it is an honor to be with you and Kurt today. Um, I'm absolutely a supporter of the Earthwise Center and all of its projects. Couldn't be more excited that you're coming here again, uh, you and your partner, to do this retreat. So, yes, my, uh, my entire reason for being is this shift, and I know it is yours as well. Um, I do have a PowerPoint I'd like to share with you. So I've titled this Igniting the Fifth Paradigm to made up not only with the work that Earthwise and the Oracle Institute do, but also because that is the title of the uh, upcoming future human intensive and really hoping there's a few slots left, really hoping some of you will join us. So let me tell you a little bit about the Oracle Institute. We are a spiritual think tank. And we do study the nexus between religion, politics, civil rights, and human evolution. Um, our formal mission statement is Thomas Jefferson's Act for Religious Freedom, which is still the law of the land in Virginia. Um, and incidentally, we've had to sue on our own mission statement before, but that's a story for, for another day. Um, and we do have a very strong um, patriotic sub-theme to our work, uh, particularly given where the United States of America is right now. So. All of our programs are pluralistic in nature and progressive because we're all about 
the new world, which we call the fifth paradigm. We also believe that science and spirituality are mating finally in just a glorious way um, with this new holistic systems theory that more and more just regular people are learning about now. We have left reductionism. We have left the, the, the physicist uh, reductionist meme. And we have moved into this whole new age, which is just so exciting for those of us who are both into reality and into metaphysics. Um, and we do think this fifth paradigm is coming. It is going to be hallmarked by this beautiful final partnership era between uh, men and women and also masculine feminine principles. And we do a lot of things here. In addition to the school, we've got the publishing house and the peace practice. So let's, let me define the fifth paradigm because this is um, the basis of our work here at the Oracle Institute. So we define the first paradigm as this period of primordial oneness. So pre-Big Bang, when we were still an idea in the mind of God, for those who like mythology, you can think of it as the period in the Garden of Eden before the fall. So this is a period where all was one. The second paradigm is when humans crafted their first belief system on their own. And our early ancestors believed in female monotheism. We know this from archaeological digs, statuary, Venus de Willendorf. Um, and this also, by the way, was the longest lived paradigm. We stayed in this paradigm for at least 20,000 years. And then humans started planting themselves. We were no longer hundreds of and gathers, and we were creating civilizations mainly along the great river valleys in the beginning and the god had splintered and we went into the third paradigm and this was the era of the gods and goddesses starting with the sumerian babylonian egyptian greek roman uh and then hindu pantheons and what's interesting about this paradigm is that one of those religions did survive hinduism is still an active religion but we think of the others as mythology and we study them and as a, as a really interesting, um, you know, mythological, maybe moral in some cases, stories, but we don't believe in those gods and goddesses anymore. And then we went into the fourth paradigm, and this is where we've been for the last 2,000 years. The Abrahamic religions brought us back to monotheism, but sadly, it was as though they weren't sophisticated enough yet to envision God as either gender full or gender less, and we lost the sacred feminine. Um, so what we believe is that this fifth era, this fifth paradigm is happening right now. It's um, not going to be a resurgence of goddess worship in the old school way, but it's going to be a more sophisticated blending and understanding of masculine and feminine energies. So just a little slide on how the brain works and also how mystics view the masculine and feminine. So many People probably have this in high school biology. We know that the right side of the brain is where the creativity seat is. This is where intuition and our more creative aspects of our being, we access through that lobe or, or reside in that lobe. And then the left side is our logical side. This is where we do our analysis. This is where we study facts and figures and math. Um, and so what we've discovered or what scientists have discovered is, believe it or not, women's brains are wired a little differently than men's. Women's brains are more networked. And that's relevant because of where we're going in terms of our spirituality. Women seem to be leading the charge and understanding better, not necessarily quicker or in any sense like a superior um, understanding, but women seem to have an easier ability to access the right side of their brain and then explore it deeper. So on the mystical side, it's viewed as um, the should do energy. Sophia is associated, the holy Shekna is associated with the right side of the brain, whereas the left side is the can do energy. It's, it's the manifestation energy and neither one can operate without the other. But what's interesting is when you do network your lobes, when you do spiritually network your your visions your meditations what you end up are with are win-win solutions so the law of gender is inherent in one of my two favorite paths hermeticism and it's a whole archical um wisdom tradition and if you look closely at that slide gender is the very first law of the universe in the Kabbalion. um and i have this quote here 
Gender is in everything. Everything has its masculine and feminine principles. The masculine principle corresponds to the objective, conscious mind. The feminine principle corresponds to the subjective, subconscious mind. The I represents the masculine aspect of being. The me represents the feminine as aspects of becoming. You also see the law of gender plainly illustrated in the tree of life. In the Kabbalah, there's a masculine and a feminine pillar. And if you look at the top triad, you see that that is the path to get to God, mind, Keter. So that top triad is what the old trinities used to be based on and still should be. But in the case of Christianity, for instance, it became God, the Father, God, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, what's the Holy Ghost? That's our missing uh, Sophia. That's who that is. Um, I've got a picture of St. Sarah here. She's one of the Black Madonnas. And the Gnostics never lost the mystical truth of the genderful nature of the Godhead and also how it relates to the earth plane. Um, this was my teacher, Tal Malachi. One of the quotes from his book is that these two pillars represent the eternal play of opposites in dynamic interaction. Evil is imbalanced force, severity and imbalance is cruelty and oppression. Mercy and imbalance is weakness that allows and facilitates great evil. True compassion is a dynamic balance of severity and mercy. So at the bottom of the slide, I have just this question, why has it been so hard for humans, for our cultures, and it's pretty global, to not integrate the law of gender? What is holding us back? And I explore this in my most recent book, The Light and the New Human. I mean, the, the easiest answer is just lingering lizard brain. It's just the slow pace of evolution. It's just taking us a while to get gender relations in order. There's another theory, um, catastrophia, that has to do with this, the civilizations that have collapsed in the past, that we have somewhere buried in our brains and in our hearts, this um, knowledge of a prior trauma that was just devastating for the planet and for us is during our evolutionary ascent. Some people think that the alien astronaut theory explains why men and women don't get along as well as they should. Um, in the Sumerian legends, we were tweaked um, to become very subservient as a race. So maybe that's part of the explanation. Um, then there are more metaphysical ones like, is the earth plane a perpetual kindergarten? Is this a prison planet? Is this planet programmed for polarity and for strife and for gender difficulty? So those are some of the theories that I... I explore the book. So we have a church called Oracle Temple. And in this church, we are very, very much wanting to and hopefully are modeling what we believe is where spirituality is going. This is going to be where humans um, not only go, those of us who are sort of cutting edge and our openness and, and willingness to accept new data, but even, even sort of regular people on the street are really wondering like well, what's up with that feminine you know what happened to mary magdalene what happened to these female avatars so it's really catching on um and most new human I, I use the phrase new human in the book uh Anna Luce uses future humans so more and more humans are viewing god as energy unity consciousness they're, they're more principles moral principles like truth love and light our motto um we also in our church, worship both the divine masculine and feminine. And again, this is not a return to paganism. This is not a return to the second paradigm that I showed on that previous slide. This is a more advanced, and if you're a Spiral Dynamics fan, a Ken Wilber fan, you know what the term second tier means. So this is a second tier expression of the Heros Gamos. This is seeing the magic in sacred union, in gender equality, and in female autonomy. We also endorse, na endorse nature mysticism. And again, this is a second tier expression of what we would have called paganism. And this is where most young people are. They are blissing out in nature. They are kayaking down the river behind me and they are becoming one with the universe. And we do encourage everyone here to have a practice and, be and engage in mindful thinking and mindful awareness because good thoughts, good deeds, and good words do equal advancement. So this is just a fun slide of some paired avatars through history. So we've got 
Osiris and Isis. We've got Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Uh, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross were best friends and helped one another when the Spanish Inquisition was after each one of them. Um, I threw Barbie and Ken in here because I've seen the movie now. And for those of you who haven't seen it, mini spoiler alert. I'm not going to spoil the movie, but it is absolutely about when are we going to be partners, full partners in creating this fifth world. And in the movie, they're not there yet. It starts out in Barbie land where the women are in charge. Then patriarchy enters the scene because Ken goes to the real world. And it's a really good um, contemporary commentary on what we're struggling with. So there's two ways to achieve divine union. One is on your own, totally on your own. That's why I have this, this, uh, sl this very beautiful picture of Shiva and Shakti merged. And this has been something I personally have been working on for the last couple of years. I shaved my head. I'm growing it out again, my hair out. But I shaved my head. I wanted to play with androgyny for a while and just see how it felt not to associate with either gender for a while. But really, the goal is to not only feel both your masculine and feminine energies inside of you, but ideally to find a partner and explore divine union as a couple. And here I've um, interjected the um, seven laws of the universe with the seven chakras. Um, and I love this quote from Jesus. This is in the Gospel of Thomas. When you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the upper like the lower, and when you make the male and female into a single one, so that the male will not be male, nor the female be female, then you enter the kingdom. Just real quick, these are two of my favorite mystical power couples, and they sort of hit the, the United States at the same time. Walter and Leo Russell were on the East Coast, and Manly and Marie Hall were on the West Coast. And for those of you who don't know much about Walter Russell, when he died, Walter Cronkite said America had just lost its Leonardo da Vinci. He, to me, is the most advanced American mystic, and I highly encourage people to learn about him. And I devote the last chapter of my book partly to the discoveries of Walter Russell because he had spontaneous enlightenment and was doing astrophysics with Tesla and could do anything. He built the first skyscraper. He was an architect. He was he was a um, sculptor. His 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 works of art are considered absolutely exquisite. Anyway, he wrote a book called The Secret of Light, The Universal One, and he chronicles his his personal journey and the message of the divine did. Manly and Marie Hall were the power couple on the West Coast, and Manly Hall is a little more famous than Walter Russell. We know Manley Hall because the secret teachings of all ages, the secret destiny of America. And his wife, Marie, went on a quest for Bruton Vault, which is an incredible story of the American founding fathers receiving what was left of the Templar materials. It's, it's a long legend. We don't have time for it, um, but it's quite exciting and it ties into our work. And I'll let you know why in a minute. Um, so... I have turned the spiral dynamics chart into a pyramid because many people are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this model is Maslow on steroids. And it explains the tippy top of Maslow's pyramid, which was self-actualization and more refinement. Basically, from stage six up, humans are world-centric. They're pluralistic. That means they're more than just tolerant. They're actively engaging in a holding hands holistic view of life. They're getting interconnectedness. And this is where we want humans to get. Stage six and up. The only reason there's a second black line there is because um, technically Ken Wilber says you're not second tier until you get to stage seven. But I give, I give stage six humans credit for being new humans because, well, let me read this quote. This is uh, Claire Graves. He's the professor who actually studied this and giant and other people stood on his shoulders, um, including Ken Wilber. But this quote I've always found phenomenally important. What I find explains best to me the reason that people in stage seven behave so much better quantitatively and qualitatively is this. They are simply not afraid. They are not afraid of not finding food, a stage one concern. They are not afraid that they're not going to have shelter, a stage two concern. 
They're not afraid of predatory man, stage three. They're not afraid of God, stage four. They're not afraid of not having status or making it on their own in this world, stage five. And they're not afraid of social rejection, stage six. You've got a human being who isn't afraid. So this is what's going on in the planet right now. We call this the God Gap at the Oracle Institute. More and more humans are going green. That is the fastest growing category or meme on the planet right now. But the, at the same time, the spiral is collapsing. And that's why we're seeing a rise in uh, nationalism and totalitarian regimes. Um, so we've got this huge God gap between those who are excited about the fifth world that's coming, the fifth paradigm, and those who are afraid of it. When polarity reaches this state, we are ready for a paradigm shift. And what we've noticed at the Oracle Institute is that paradigms shift when the Godhead shifts. So using the transition from uh, the third to the fourth paradigm, for instance, the Roman Empire crumbled. It, it, they, they adopted Christianity as a last-ditch effort to try to save the, um, the empire, but it didn't work. And then we went into the Dark Ages. Europe went into the Dark Ages. Thank God uh, the Middle East didn't. The, the Islamic um, scholars are the ones who preserved the best of math and science and biology. But the Western world went into a uh, long, long medieval dark era. So we are in a great cusp right now. This is a very dangerous time to be alive. Um, and just want just wanted to depict for you exactly what's happening with this God gap. So at Oracle campus, we have dedicated um, the entire campus to the new world. And when Barbara Marburg was here, she, she said, well, this is Camp Eve. And I said, well, what's that? And she said, well, Camp David is where heads of state in the old world would go to meet and smoke their cigars and drink their brandy and problem solve old world issues. And she said, it can't be. This is where heads of sectors would meet, sectors of society, her, her famous wheel. And they would also meet in a holistic and hallowed setting, but they would be problem solving and brainstorming and co-creating the new world, co-creating being a very important word in that sentence. Um, so that is why we built this campus. We want to be a situs for this type of very high level brainstorming, strategic thinking. And yes, we are building Barbara's name of a peace room as sophisticated as a war room. So I love this tagline we used. Do you know Virginia has two Pentagons? Well, it does. And ours is almost complete. It looks completed from the outside. It's not quite done. And actually, it's a Pentagon inside of a Pentagon because the temple is also pentagonal. And that is because we're all about the fifth paradigm. We're hoping you will support us, by the way, during our fundraising that's coming up to finish the building. Um, so let's just talk a minute. I'm not sure if I'm running over. Let's see clock. Let's just talk a second about sacred sites and sacred geometry, because not only is the Pentagon a Pentagon, the numerology that we chose for the building is highly significant. The numbers five and 11. So the exterior walls are 55 feet long. I discovered later, a friend pointed out to me that the Washington Monument at its base it's 55 feet long. It's also 555 feet tall. So it too is based on five and 11. And if you know about the golden ratio, that's when uh, Pythagoras discovers that the pentacle, the pentagon shape is contained in the golden ratio. It's, control, it's contained in the Fibonacci sequence. And it's just um, in that spiral right there, the Harris spiral is also based on five. So it's a very powerful number we happen to be coming up on the fifth era of humanity, but in and of itself, there's a reason why the war Pentagon is a Pentagon, a very powerful number. And that is our flag of Virginia there. I can't go into all these mysteries, but I wanted to point out that that's Athena on our flag. Uh, Francis Bacon designed our flag, and he, she's got her throat on, or her foot on the throat of a monarch who's lost the crown. Um, underneath of our flag is... George Washington's pentagonal fort that he built during the Revolutionary War. I, I discovered that after the fact, too. So, again, there's a really strong patriotic, patriotic sub-theme to our work. And that picture on the right, the stone, that's the stone of scone. That's, the, that's Jacob's stone. 
And that is a story for the for another day. We had in our position for a while and we're gonna get back. We also have a community here. I just wanna mention that um, if anyone listening is looking for community and looking for a very high level, ooh, mission driven community, please reach out to us because you're the type of human we're looking for. And just ending with our uh, our trilogy, I've been also pumping the Anna Luce's trilogy lately because our my third book and her series are just so aligned. So thank you. I'm gonna stop share and pass it back to you, Anna Luce. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> And those slides really do bring it alive. I mean, it, I just love it. Every time you present this, it's it's so rich, so rich. So really, this is amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to um, to bring Kurt here and then bring you back later. So Kurt, I uh, would love to hear a little bit from your wisdom, especially about these deeper psychological shifts that you have been seeing also as a therapist for a long time um, that really make us the new and fifth paradigm people. Thank you very much, Laura, for this beautiful presentation. So today is a special day that shows us in the sense that we were not planning to have it today, but Things turn out that it ended up being today. And what is today? Today is this peculiar day where in some places one celebrates the Virgin Mother. A fantastic, amazing concept. A feminine of eternity with the ability to self-create all across the history of humanity. If you see this thread going through and telling us that there was here and there virgin birth in several places, in several countries, in different ethnicity, basically a foundation for a planetary consciousness. It's there. The thread is there. Therefore, it is essential that we have a look at this eternal feminine. It takes different shapes. Sometimes you would even see someone embodying both aspects, that is, the feminine and the masculine with a certain predominance of character, irrespective of their own gender, so that you would therefore have sometime leaders that would behave more like men than the women they are. Or you would have men that would behave more like a woman. Strange. Not really. Because we're just an appearance of this energy which is constantly transforming itself. We are destined to something else. This future human state that has always been around from the beginning. As someone says, in the end was the beginning. It is there. It is in us. It is manifesting itself. Now, something strange. You've just been introduced or exposed again, for those who already know it, with these two hemispheres of your brain, right and left, and with specific capacities for the right and for the left. Some people even say that, in fact, intelligence is not in our brain. Our brain is just a manifestation of it, of this higher ability 
that is us. And some researchers have found out that this localization of abilities on the right or on the left can be just the opposite. What we normally see in the right can be all seen on the left and vice versa. But this is more a question of culture. In the Western world, it is as it was presented. However, they found out in some research in Japan that it can be just the opposite. Therefore, strengthening this concept that we're not just the brain. We are much more than that. And the brain is like bringing us from non-local to specific. It's like when you do some experiments, we have a biasness. That is, what we induce in the conception of the experiment might influence the outcome of the experiment. It might sound strange, very unscientific, and yet it is also an opening in what and how we could change things. In the same manner that some psychological experience has proved that although the majority of the group might be going in one direction, if a small group within that group organizes itself and try in a steady manner to manifest something specific, this would gradually take over the group. So this is a wonderful power that we have. Therefore, we can at any time bring in to this future human that is in us, bringing the future into being, moving completely into this fifth paradigm. Now, we might say, okay, it could be straight on like that. It is not, and has never been in evolution. If you really look at it, you might see that sometimes it would appear like a spiral, whoops, or if you look at the five-pointed star, when you trace it, it will go like this, that, here, here, and back to the star. So this is essential that we can release ourselves within the trust of this spiral movement, bringing us there, as long as we are steady in what we want to manifest. For some people, it would be a trinity. For others, it might just be one full expression of compassion. Without having to understand all the other details. Compassion, especially right now, if you look around you, is something that this world desperately needs. So, bringing the future into being can go through this compassion that we all need. When I say we all need, it's not just that we give compassion to somebody else. We start by giving compassion to ourselves, by accepting who we are and how we are, and how we can be in harmony with ourselves. Because if you look at this drawing of the five-pointed star, the pentagram, you would see that the proper pentagram is always with inside a human being with head up. So a balance of uh, the different elements that exist. A balance of what may, one may call quintessence. How do we get back there? 
we check ourselves. We see if we're not being too much this or too much that. If there's a middle way that can at the same time not only put us at peace with ourselves, but also with the world and help the world get there in this deep inner peace that needs to be manifested, not just deep inner peace at the top of the mountain. We're not into that. We are more into attempting to manifest it, not just through talks, not just through meetings, but with little actions every day in our daily life, trying to improve things around us, choose whatever is our own core. Some would be defending certain specific cause. Others would be attempting to develop something which will bring people more together, help them understand better what's going on. Some will contribute to organizations, to ideas, to concepts. Basically, in any case, this movement from inside to the outside is a gift to the world, is a gift of compassion to this hard, terrible reality that you can face every day just by looking at the news. You will see things upside down around the world, everyone pointing the finger at somebody else. Whether one is right or wrong is not what matters. What matters is how can the people suffering be helped? How can compassion change their life? Of course, we need some rules, because as you know, if you're just putting all that you have in a bucket where there's a hole, like the song says, there's a hole in the bucket, dear Henry, dear Henry, of course there is. So we need to be careful. We have two hands. One, we check that there's no hole in the bucket and we make sure we drop it. And the other hand, we put in all the compassion we can. Like as if our heart, which is even more complex because it has several rooms, because we have several types of compassion, several types of love that we can give to others, including, first of all, to ourselves, to our own hurts. We need to be kind to ourselves, gentle to the things we've been through, which have helped us grow and sometimes not enough. And from there, like a trampoline, we can bounce and give to the world this wonderful love that we have in our heart. Thank you for feeling what I've said. Let's hope we have this wonderful opportunity to see more of it manifest. Thank you so much, Kurt, for this very important and also beautiful, compassionate wisdom. <laughs> That's really, really nice. So I'd like to share with you also now a little bit about um, what we'll be working with if you're going to be joining us for the intensive, um, which is from the 29th of September until the 4th, 1st of October. And uh, Laura will share more about the logistical details uh, in a minute. Um, there are not many places left. But I just want to share with you some insights on that, that even if you're not coming, you can still benefit from this wisdom. I think that's important. So first of all, just let's just reflect for a moment what we just heard Laura speak about and Kurt as well. And I want to share with you a reflection that stands out for me uh, as I'm listening to both of them. And that is that within us, we have all amazing and different and the same also potentials, right? 
But what makes a paradigm shift is the patterning uh, of the relationship of these various potentials. And that is really fascinating to, to just reflect on in a minute. So uh, all through time, we've had masculine and feminine <laughs> qualities uh, and, and non-gender and the child wisdom. Um, we have also all of us, we are composed of or even by five elements, space and air and fire and water uh, and earth. Yeah. There's also many of the ancient visit traditions, five elemental wisdoms as well. And so we can go on. So we're seeing this pattern of the five, but they can be in different orders, as many of the alchemists will know. So a question to reflect on for yourself is if you, if you take a moment to connect with all of your own potentials as a human being, your personal potentials, um, some of them that are really unique to you, the potentials that also were passed on and supported by your ancestors, uh, perhaps also your culture, your country, humanity at large. And then there are also the, the relationships with nature. And so, so for people who have a close relationship, for example, with totemic relationships with an animal, we we'll say, oh, I always see the, the little snake passing by when I'm going through a deep process of transformation. That must be time for shedding my skin. Now, if somebody who feels close to the bear, they may know if I want to transform myself, it will require that I go through a process of hibernation because that's what bear medicine is about. It's the ability to go deeply within my own dreaming and from there do the rebirth. Maybe you connect when you're going with transformation with the butterfly, which in which case you may find yourself in periods of cocooning <laughs> when you really feel the old structures dissolving inside the cocoon uh, so that then your new patterns and your new capacities are coming forth. So just take a moment to just even have that presence that within you are both your own personal potentials, but are also the potentials that are dormant and latent within us that are already belonging at a higher level, at a metal level, to what our species is becoming. We form part of the earth. And so nature herself is very, very intelligent. We're coming out of billions of years of evolutionary processes, both from a universe perspective as well as from our uh, planet Earth perspective. And in, in each of those shifts of paradigm, paradigm means also paradigma means pattern. Yes? So when there's a shift of paradigm, there is a significant shift of the patterning or the patterning of all of those relationships. So if you yourself feel a resonance with um, coming into this fifth paradigm of a deeper partnership, then allow this new patterning, this new patterning of humanity's next evolutionary step, allow this new patterning that is part of that fifth paradigm consciousness, uh, allow that new patterning to rearrange and re-coordinate your potentials. And this is a lot what we've been doing with what we're talking about to five future archetypes. And during the intensive, we're going to take a deep dive through nine sessions uh, and starting on the Friday and we're completing on the Sunday after lunch. We're going to really take a deep dive into these five specific archetypal patterns uh, that are taking us from the pure potential of our future human potential of the emerging next era to a process of full actualization. And um, this, all of this work around the future archetypes is in fact, it started during my PhD research in systemic transformation. And the question I was asking myself uh, as a system scientist is, if we're all speaking about the shift in eras, then surely this new era <laughs> needs to have other archetypes. Uh, because if, if, it's, if it's a shift of era, it's, it's, if it's really a paradigm shift, if you have a structural shift, um, then what are these emerging new archetypes that we need to be aware of and that help us? And so that was one of my research questions. And the second one was, what makes the change of eras possible? So what are the archetypes that are in that liminal space that are in the in-between and that really are there for the archetypes of this deeper metamorphic transformation that are helping us to start activating, engaging, and eventually actualizing these potentials of our next evolutionary step while we're still in the structures of the old, just like you're seeing with the butterfly. The butterfly imaginal potential already exists within the caterpillar. 
uh, from its birth. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where the five future archetypes are coming in. So they're very specific also in the transition of eras, as well as already representing these qualities that we are seeing, especially if we're looking at the younger generation, generation set and generation alpha. Alpha generation as the generations of the kids that have been born uh, from 2010 up till 2024. Isn't it amazing? We are actually in this fifth paradigm. We're also at the beginning of a whole new generational cycle. Now, these beautiful potentials of these uh, of our future humans, you could say, or the children, they are of course also part of us. Um, and in order for us to be good future ancestors to them that evolutionary drive is already activating in us and speaking to us in terms of our own shedding of our skin, of what we need to let go, what we need to release so that we can come into these higher conscious patternings of this beautiful deep partnership. And I'm just going to name for you quickly what those archetypes are, um, and then we will in the follow-up also share with you more links where you can learn more about that. So the first archetype is the wholeness coda. And the wholeness code, you can think of them also as the designers, as the architects, as the coders uh, of new possibilities. So that really speaks at the level of the imaginal disk of the caterpillar at that stage. So we're talking about uh, really of the deepest potential. And then the second one, the second archetype is then the future creative. So when in the first archetype, we're learning to ask the questions, what is the deepest structural shift that I need to make? For example, do we need to change the rules of the game? Do we need even to change the laws themselves? Are we in the appropriate constitutions? Uh, what of the systems need to change? Are the parameters of these systems ever going to uh, support us to really develop our next evolutionary capacities? Now, as that starts to activate at the code level, at the really deepest archetypal structural level of reality and ourselves, then the future creative, which is really the one that creates the possibilities for possibilities, starts to engage that potential. And that potential now becomes a possibility space. So these are the inventors. These are the innovators. These are also the crazy scientists who will go out there, but it can be the wizards and the mystics as well. They're the ones that are starting to get pregnant of that future already at that imaginal level. And they start to see these possibilities and they start to see these new ideas. Yeah? And that will catalyze in a deep evolutionary change process. It will catalyze also trigger healing and deeper transformation inside the cocoon. And this is where the third archetype comes in. These are the ev evolutionary catalysts. They are catalyzing an evolutionary process. These are also your healers. These are your midwives. These are also your teachers, your facilitators. Uh, these are also the mystics that help you to surrender to the deeper change process because now we are cocooning so that these possibilities can become a probabilities. Um, and what when you're in that stage of the third evolutionary catalyst stage, this is when you start to understand, huh, if I really want to give birth and be the birth for this new future, then there is a death process as well. So how can we die with dignity to our old selves? And as we start to cocoon and we start to go within and we're growing our next evolutionary body, we start to give birth now to the fourth future archetype. And that's the pattern weaver. These are also your community builders. These are the ones that are building the root systems of the new systems, um, the networkers, the collaborators. What happens in ourselves then is that all these new possibilities that have been growing inside the cocoon are start to become networked. They start to become coherent and they start to be able to help us to emerge from the cocoon. So that now we're starting to embody truly our future potential. And that then catalyzes and brings into being this fifth archetype, which is the new paradigm storyteller. This is when we become the new story. We become the pollinator wherever we go now, <laughs> like this beautiful butterfly that has now emerged. Wherever we go, wherever we land, we activate these, uh, these possibilities for, for humanity, for our world, and we become our story of transformation. So we're going to be exploring this in depth through the intensive, it's also the first time I'll be giving these transmissions of these archetypes that have been central to all of our work uh, in person. So I'm really looking forward to that. And Laura, I want to bring you back with me here so that you can actually share with us a little bit 
what we can also expect at your beautiful place. And um, yeah, let us know how many places are even left. <laughs> I think there's about five, four or five slots left. Um, we didn't want this to become too large, by the way. This is going to be an intimate space. Um, a lot of uh, personal, very personal uh, interaction with teachers and with our sacred space. Uh, the campus, everything outdoors is dedicated to the indigenous. I think I had a, a photo at the end of the PowerPoint. That's our Turtle Island Labyrinth. Um, I actually walked it last night with my daughter uh, almost close to midnight. We were out there walking the labyrinth. Um, we also have the Kogi Kiva, which we did build in honor of the Kogi who came here in 2018. That was just an amazing um, blessing for the land. And we have a Peace Pole Medicine Wheel. So we're going to be using some of the outdoor space during the course of the weekend. Um, but I think primarily we're going to be in the Peace Pentagon. And magic, we've got five future archetypes and five points in a, in a penta pentacle. So the building couldn't be more appropriate for um, learning about these five future archetypes, learning about the fifth paradigm and receiving five initiations. And I don't wanna to take too much time because I know we wanna have some Q and A, but it's a very so setting. The river behind me, that's the new river, which was completely misnamed. It is the oldest river in America, the oldest river in the Western hemisphere, which is why the Kogi wanted to see it. And some geologists think it's the oldest river in the world. So I was guided here, and I know for very, very um, specific reasons. We are building a city of light here, by the way. That's why we called our community the Valley of Light. That's sort of a, a nod to them and her, the city of light in Italy. Um, so the land has been just been kind of cooking with all the good energy. Um, that we have brought to it, that our guests have brought to it, that participants have brought to it. We had a, a very large uh, peace gathering just last month in which um, Kumi John Sur was here with um, May Peace Prevail on Earth. She's the group that makes the, the, the medicine, or sorry, the peace polls, um, the peace on earth people were here um, participating in that game at the moment. So, the land has just been soaking up um, our best intentions for this sacred site. And I can guarantee you a warm and um, mm, just, it feels like an oasis here, frankly. I can guarantee you that when you arrive, you are going to feel um, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> I know it is because I was just there with you a couple of yeah. months ago and yeah I experienced how amazing and how powerful this is so I could and bringing you back here with us as well so that we can open it now to the uh, to the Q&A um, we really I'm just adding some more people here I'd love to hear from all of you now so we have about half an hour <laughs> to actually have conversations with all of you so Hi. hello good to see you <laughs> Yes, good to see you too. I'm I'm coming, so I'm I'm getting very yes. excited. By this. <laughs> and um, I, I just I just thought it might be nice to um, uh, talk about perhaps what preparation uh, you feel would be really valuable uh, for you on on the way on the, on the way here on the way to you, as it were. What, yes. What do you think? I love that. I think first of all is clarity of intention in yourself that you understand that you're going to go through a very deep transformational process. So it's like an agreement with yourself that it's okay to shut whatever you need to let go of in a healthy and gentle way. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> We're changing that pattern. It doesn't have to be all these dark nights of the soul. So <laughs> you can do it with joy. But it's like giving yourself permission already to saying, hey, I'm going through a deeper transformational journey. So whatever it is, whatever is mine to complete now with grace, whatever it's mine to that I can also already let go of. Um, that you can already do that prior. So then it's almost like when you're coming into the retreat, um, you're already in a space of receptivity and you're, you're already in a space of kind of building from how the future is, is calling you forth. So I think that is the 
the, the, the best preparation. Also, uh, if you can have a journal um, in which to write. So I've always find when we're going through this transformation, just before already our dreams can become very powerful and meaningful um, and start noticing that. So just writing that down in your journal, as well as of course, taking your journal with uh, when you're coming here and afterwards. So keeping notice of, of that also. Um, and then also starting to, to look around in your life, like what are the patterns and what are the, um, the animals that are showing up? Um, and, and what are they telling me? Yeah, so because knowing that life is going to be uh, a mother of herself is supporting you in this transformation. So they're always little helpers, <laughs> sometimes in the most unexpected way that are already prompting, you know, prompting those, uh, those messages. So those are the ways of, uh, of preparation, of course, uh, eat healthy, drink plenty, because as we're going through a deep transformational process, it also is a deep change process for our body, um, including new neurological pathways that we are growing and cultivating too so it's also about being mindful of that um and, and some some stretches some some gentle walking as well but just making sure you know good uh, self-care rest well <laughs> before you come uh and uh and and yeah come with a smile come with joy expect this to be absolutely amazing maybe kurt you you would like to add some wisdom to that <laughs> Not much, except that, as Anne Luz mentioned, if you have any dreams, just write them down. Or some people have difficulty to recall their dreams. So what you can do is that before you get out of bed, you keep your eyes closed and you try to remember what you've been dreaming. Only then you open your eyes and you remember again. And finally, you write them down or you put it on an audio if that's easier for you. Even if you don't remember it in detail, just the idea of the dream can be most useful. So this is one of the things that you can do. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Laura, was there anything you wanted to add as well? No, I think you guys hit it all. Just come ready to <laughs> be spiritually infused. And and again, the, the property itself is the proper container for this sort of work. So yeah. You're gonna you're gonna have an experience, there's no doubt. Mm. Probably multiple yeah. experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. We look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you too. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Bye for now. <laughs> yes, here you are. Yeah, hi. hi. I'm wondering, Annalise, in your uh, presentation on those um, stages of transformation, Yes. I'm wondering how does the IntelliKey come into that? in your perception about how it works? Because I know it's been mentioned, you know, within um, the quantum field idea. And I just wondered if you could elaborate a bit on that. Yes. Well, in the Future Humans Trilogy, which I've co-authored my dear friend, Dr. Jean Houston, uh, she always talks about the IntelliKey. Yeah. <laughs> so Jean and I have had many wonderful conversations where we're exploring that. And very often what I'm calling a kind of future human new operating system or higher guidance system is what for her is her IntelliKey. Uh, so when we started to work together, we noticed that we had different wordings for something that's very, very similar. Um, and that both speaks to that there is a, there's a deeper innate wisdom in us that knows already and guides us towards our next step. And that's a deep wisdom that you can bring forth, that you can connect with, uh, that Jean often likes to also make really tangible. So sometimes even by putting your hands in the field and, and, and really feeling that and making that relationship. Um, this is why for me, when I speak the word future, I don't see future as something as that's further up the timeline. To me, future is a state of information of the imaginal realm of consciousness. Yeah, so I'll just repeat that. That future to me is a state of information, uh, a superposition state of information, in fact, from a quantum perspective, that is still in that imaginal kind of dreaming, deep dreaming state, um, non-local, that's non-local consciousness. Uh, but it's already here now. 
And quite often people visualize and imagine as a future is something that it hasn't happened yet, as if it's further out and further away from them. Um, and that creates a distance and it also creates a, a duality. So if we're seeing that future impact from that, is, is that deeper, uh, higher order possibility of our own future becoming here and now already, um, then when you're accessing that, you, you are in a quantum field. And that's also, of course, the place where the entelechy lives as well. And so they are kind of different wordings, but uh, for, yeah, very similar concepts. So does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's come across really clearly. <laughs> That's great. And yeah, appreciate your question. Thank you so much. <laughs> and let me bring Karen here. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I am so excited. I'm going to be there. Yay! Um, <laughs> <Great. yay. Yeah. laughs> um, I live two hours and 50 minutes away. And so when I got the email, I, I was like, I, I could drive. This is so doable. It's right. <laughs> anyway, so I'm just thrilled. Um, so nice. Yeah, it's so it's so wonderful. And I over the years have developed um, a coaching consulting practice where I'm applying this kind of stuff with individual and team and organizations. Yes. So I feel deeply honored and privileged to be working with people in business who want this kind of transmission. And so I guess my question is about application. So I'm down with the personal transformation, you know, in that full on. And also I'm wondering about uh, transmission into our work applying what we're talking about and whether and how that's going to be I mean I just assume we're going to be doing this but I'd, I'd love oh, to yes. hear you talk you know to hear yes. <laughs> maybe to have you speak a bit to that because that's that's such a, um, a compelling motivation for me to yes. be practically bringing all of this into the world of course. So first of all, that's coming through a lot in the anecdotes and the stories as well, because everything that we are doing here and we're sharing is also part of our business strategies, Earthrise. So Earthrise is a non-profit company, okay? Um, so it's it's working with these archetypal wisdoms. Um, I apply that uh even in technology. So when we are working with new technologies for decentralized autonomous organizations, we did a webinar on that uh, recently. Um, these archetypes have become part of the role models that people are now using to actually create value in the organizations. Um, we will be starting to apply that soon as, or, as well for creating a constitution for AI. Um, well, there may be AI characters that we'll be working with. Uh, in the game that we are developing right now, the Earthrise game, these archetypes have become game characters that are given younger generations these future human powers in order to be addressing the collapse and extinction game that humanity has been trapped in. Um, also at the, the final session um, on the Sunday, which is um, of this retreat, we'll be working with how do you work with the Earthrise Constitution as your own constitutional compass? So how can you use that constitution as a compass for yourself, for your organization, uh, for example, to, to help if you're working with your clients? Uh, read it better in business or personal coaching clients, you can help them to really create a very powerful evolutionary framework for their life. Get clarity on what's my purpose, what are my core values, both inner and outer values that I need. What are my new operating systems? What are the guiding principles for being able to actualize my purpose? And what are also my commitments uh, that I can make um, in terms of how I'm truly living my purpose and also collaborating with others so we can amplify each other. So there will be a lot of different ways that we can be working with and, uh, and the opportunity, of course, because we are in a small group where we can dive into those questions where I can share with you how this is also informing, for example, new business models. Um, you know, for, So what does that mean if you have a business ID, how you take it all the way from an ID into actualization? And we apply that on the elemental stages, which is really important when we're working with manifestation that helps you, for example, to understand that if you are all at the stage of air, 
lots of great ideas about what you want to do. And then it goes into fire. So now we're igniting it with passion and enthusiasm, but we're still in that expanded stage. So we're working with a, with a business. Um, and in order to manifest it, you're going to have to come to water. <laughs> and water also contracts. And for a lot of people that feels like, oh, but I wanted to do this and that and that. And if I need to focus and am I going to lose something? Or, yeah, so we're going to go through that water, through that contraction. In, uh, but in a good way, this is the contract to get ready for birth so that we can move it into earth. Um, so it's also about recognizing, of course, what is the specific state and stages of consciousness that we are using um, when we are bringing things forth and into being. And that applies to whether you are an innovator, whether you are working in business, or if you're working as an educator, or you're facilitating with people. It's understanding where in the creation process are we and what are the appropriate steps and, and stages that we need to be working with. Uh, for those people who know me, they they know that um, kind of my one of my skills uh, or talents, <laughs> the where you want to see it, is to work all the way from vision and possibility to totally practical application, <laughs> to knowing as far as if you need to code your website <laughs> and you need to create your marketing strategy. So. Uh, because I've been working as an entrepreneur, uh, uh, of course, for so long to, to be able to work through that full spectrum. Yeah? Um, if you then take with that Kurt's uh, amazing wisdom also in as a therapist in coaching people uh, and people also in executive position uh, every day through his practice, where he really has to help them to, to be able to apply um, the ideas that they're having, the visions that they're having, but also to be able to shift any self-defeating and harmful patterns that are getting in the way of truly living their brilliance. And then, you know, Laura and all the gifts that she's bringing. So I, I believe that a lot of that is the combined field of our wisdoms also is what allows us to have these breakthrough conversations and discoveries but with also very clear steps and processes and templates that are helping you uh, to have that uh, yeah, as a compass for your life, but also in your work with others. So does that, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. Thank you so much. <laughs> or oh, while we're waiting for someone to raise the hand, was there, Kurt or Laura, anything you wanted to add to this? Well, I would add that this great cusp period, the, the space in between uh, the fourth and the fifth paradigm has been actually in existence for at least a hundred years. That's why we call it a great cusp. So the energy behind the shift has been growing and growing and growing really since the industrial age. Um, I just wanted to for those who are concerned, as I am, about the regression with regard to women's rights, which we're seeing dramatically in the United States, um, it's really a last gasp of air, I believe, before patriarchy finally cedes to partnerism, to use Rianne Eisler's words, um, the term that she likes to use. And for those who are in despair, um, it doesn't mean that 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 we're going to get there without additional effort but i do believe that these are telltale signs um of the old world collapsing so they're getting desperate uh to retain power to to retain that sort of domination over uh institutions um even institutions of learning which is frightening i mean that they're banning books in the United States is just unbelievable. But all of that to me is an indication that the polarity, yes, is increasing, but it means we're getting near the point where we can get the ball over the finish line. We can help everyone access what the Hopi called the fifth world. Walter Russell called it the, the fifth age of mankind, Madame Blavatsky. Like they saw all of this coming a hundred years ago. Um, and indeed, Francis Bacon saw it coming even back when he lived. He wrote a novella called The New Atlantis, um, which many people think is about Virginia because he named Virginia um, himself as the high chancellor of England. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody to just keep your energy high, as pure as possible, and do whatever is in your 
ability in your sphere to do to help get, again, this ball over the finish line. Um, we're getting close. We're getting close to manifesting this new world that has been prophesied for a long time. And um, know that we're all in here at the Oracle Institute. And we would love for you to come to the campus and feel the energy that we're infusing this shift with. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Good. Is there anything you want to add to that? As you know, I tend more to speak through silence than words. However, I have noticed something, which is this great enthusiasm from those that join this call. And furthermore, that some people just live 15 minutes away from you, Laura. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. You can see that there's not only a synergy, but also an attraction to your place. You don't always see that. At the same time, we're living this wonderful age of technology where it's a form of miracle which allows us from different parts of the planet to talk to each other, to exchange, to listen to what the other one has to bring. And from this, create something new to attract the future to be. That is amazing. Thank you. And I'd like to add also something, um, you know, Laura, when you were speaking about this polarity increasing, which is what, you know, we have noticed as well. So I want to give all of you a practice who are listening, how you can work with that. You know, so when you're stretching the elastic bands like that, or you're working with those polarities, it also builds up the momentum for the counterforce to that. Okay. Um, so if you're letting your mind only be put in the, in the polarity, you may feel as if you're really stretched and increasing divisions, and, and that can be very, very unsettling. But if you can be aware and be with, so if this is being stretched, what's the counter movement to this polarization? And you now that's at the, on the inner plane, and then you start working with that to produce the integration, and through that, the transformation. That's the alchemy for the new. So when we are working also with the, with the fifth, you can also conceptualize that as if you're looking at the four quadrants that we're seeing. Uh, Kurt also spoke about the four chambers in the heart. We have also the four chambers in, in our brain. Yeah? So if we're, if we're looking at when those quadrants, if they still, if they remain dualized, they will stay in their own quadrant structure. And then there is very little learning, very little program, progress and very little transformation. But that's that kind of stuckness. That's that fourth paradigm pattern, uh, Laura, that you, that you spoke of, that keeps us all <laughs> divided and polarized and dualized. Yeah. But if you're, but all of that is, it can't be stuck in its old place anymore because the old structure of that paradigm is crumbling indeed. But as that's crumbling and it's no longer kind of oppressed in those quadrants, it starts to move, it starts to want to interact, it's, and it, but it doesn't quite know its relationship yet. So sometimes you go, ah, I'm afraid of you, or you're this, or <laughs> judging, and <laughs> or I want to kill you. And there are all kinds of bizarre responses that we're getting, but all that's what's happening is, is there's a great movement, great interaction that hasn't yet come into this new patterning. So in the fifth paradigm patterning that's emerging, it's when actually those quadrants, they start to integrate, and there's an alchemy there. There's like an inner marriage that's happening in there, and it's out of that process that the new comes forth. And that's a very, very different new than, oh, there's something new coming out from the future. That's, that's what I just want to clarify. That's not what we mean with future. Uh, and it's just imposing itself on the old structure as if it's a better alternative. No, that's a pattern of duality. That's not a process of integral transformation. So what we're really talking about, Hans, is with all that you are <laughs> and all of your relationships, how can this be brought into this new pattern and this new behavior, new understanding of yourself and the world yeah, that brings this beautiful new era forth? So just want to give you that as a practice. So don't get caught into the polarization, but 
work with the counter movement in your life. And then you may actually find the energy that, that helps liberate and um, moves you forward in an integral way. There you are, Robbie. <laughs> Love to hear from you. <laughs> Hello, you, everyone. Hi. Uh, thank you for having yeah. this uh, this meeting and this presentation. It's beautiful. Uh, Roshana and I are selling our house right now and planning on moving to the Oracle Institute and uh, helping build that community in a quantum way, I think is the way Laura says it. Um, I've been communicating uh, just directly with some of the people in the chat here, and it reminded me of there's nothing like making a connection energetically in person. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it, like the Zoom conferences are great, but 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 they're they're even greater after you've actually you know touched a person and shaken their hand and and. And and just been in this sphere of their energy and make that personal connection, uh, as well as uh, this is a great opportunity to be at the Oracle Institute, which has an amazing energy. So it's like the combination of those things is is very exciting. And there's like several people have said. Hey, are you going to be there? And I said, well, it kind of depends on our house. But now I'm looking at the dates and saying, I don't know. If the house doesn't sell, maybe we'll fly out for that because it's so so amazing. Uh, people, um, Kurt and Analos, and uh, is, do I say that right, Analos? Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> uh, and, and 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 I love to see Laura and Mimi again. Um, <laughs> You know, and 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 the others that are close enough to just drive down. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, you know I'm in the technology arena, and so I'll be facilitating uh, making uh, a super highway of information capability at the Oracle Institute, the Pentagon, and all the surrounding houses. Uh, but but there's no there's no substitute for meeting people in person uh, to be in Kurt's silence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can I can feel that energy too. So thank you very much, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, hope, hopefully you. I'll see you all there. Yes, thank you so much. Well, I'm yes, <laughs> I'm Laura, excited. You yeah. See you in <laughs> yes. Well, I didn't think there was a possibility they could come because, yeah, they're they're in the process of selling the house. I just want you to know, I, I think so far you'd be the only couple attendees. And this is a very powerful uh, workshop for couples. Well, it was a very uh, compelling talk that you gave, uh, Ann Luce and uh, Kurt and Laura, about, you know, the, the new paradigm of uh, coupling or the power yes. coupling. Yes. And yeah. so uh, that's one of the things Roshan and I uh, really have a great affinity for uh, the friendship and mm -hmm. and the the uh, the things I bring and the things that she brings that are very complementary and they they're exponential in how that energy goes out in the world. And I was reminded of that yesterday. I was at Sunrise Ranch and, uh, you know, updating an internet capability from some dear friends. And they were extolling their love for us as a couple mm -hmm. and how the impact of that uh, has on that community. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I think now's a great time to uh, be part of something that amplifies that uh, in a lot of the ways that all three of you talked about. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, thanks for letting me speak. And uh, I love to uh, see you all in person. 
We really, really look forward, yes, to meeting you both and indeed on coupling. That's exactly how it works for Kurt and me as well. You know, we amplify each other, we complement each other. I uh, often say sometimes when one is silent and the other speaks, it's still a couple because <laughs> it's the other one is actually supporting, yeah, and then vice versa. And so, yes, it's it's in this partnership way uh, where there is this beautiful love and respect for each other uh, that we can all blossom and that's the partnership field, yeah, and that we, we're all embodying and uh, Laura in her way too. And <laughs> Yes, so I, I appreciate your presence that and we're looking forward to being with you soon, hopefully. <laughs> Do come. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, Thank you I so think uh, yeah. uh, Roshana would love to have a, a remote uh, to zipper my lips sometimes because I'm, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny too yeah <laughs> well you're the tech man so I'm sure you... <laughs> be careful what you invent <laughs> you know? I know <laughs> they make a collar that shocks you <laughs> to not bark <laughs> I don't want to tell her about that <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> thank you okay <laughs> And let me bring our friend Lisa here and that as a final person to share. Lisa, it's great to see you. <laughs> so good to see you. And I um, wonder if I might have a conversation perhaps after the, uh, the whole event ends, the Zoom event ends. I felt when I saw your invitation, I felt called to participate as yeah. a, a person with art and artistry I have a series of of about 56 foot paintings that are specifically for transformation and the transformation of consciousness and I'd love to share that with you later if it's possible with Laura and and Annalise and Kurt so, so I just what wanna, we'll do is Yes, <laughs> what we'll do is we will completing this webinar now, but then we will, after we stop the recording, we'll stay online for another five minutes or so. <laughs> and then we, for anyone else also who wants to stay, uh, it is late for us here in Mauritius, it's, uh, so we won't be able to go much longer, but we'll do, we'll do that. So we'll just complete this session first and then there may be some other people to also will have <laughs> some specific questions. So thank you, Lisa. Yes, we'll do that. Stay, stay on. <laughs> Great, and then I'm gonna bring us on, on gallery view now. I just wanna thank everyone so much for being with us uh, today. We hope to see you, of course, all set beautiful Peace Pentagon with Laura. Um, and um, please unmute yourself now so we can actually hear each other's voices as we say goodbye for today. Uh, thanks again for adding your wisdom and your presence and uh, for the beautiful people who you all are. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.